Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Rex uh, from Let's Grow Kids. I'll be acting as a tech host for today, uh, for this session. Please remember to stay on mute when you're not speaking, but feel free and feel free to use the, the chat um, to ask questions or uh, you can use the raise hand function if you'd like. I'm here to help with anyone that's having issues. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to our presenters and I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, Margaret Atkinson is the Director of Development and Community Relations at Winston Prouty Center for Child and Family Development. And Sharon Halvin is the CIS Specialist of Specialized Care Coordinator for Vermont Child Care Resource. I'll let you take it away. Hi, thanks, Rex. Um, welcome, everybody. So this is the issue session on the special accommodations grant, just to make sure that you're in the right place. Um, and um, we don't really have a lot of time for folks to do introductions. If there was like 10 people, we would have done that. But um, please feel free to put in the chat um, who you are and where you're from, and also um, it, what your connections to special accommodation grants are, especially if you're a provider who has um, uh, received them or used them in the past, or a, um, a parent whose child has um, uh, benefited from that program. Um, what, you know, that. And uh, so we have a, I have a PowerPoint that I'm hopefully going to share share screen i'm wondering if i can can you see that or can uh, i cannot okay i have it in front of me so <laughs> all right i'm gonna there we go share there we go better there you go um so uh there you know that's us and Sharon will take it away from here. Make sure I'm not muted. First task of the day. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Sharon Howland. I work out of Child Care Resource in Williston, Vermont, and I am the Children's Integrated Services Child Care Coordinator for Chittenden County. Um, and part of the reason I'm speaking on this topic today is uh, we're we're a large county and we utilize special accommodation grants in our early childhood community. Um, and so it's near and dear to my heart as one um, small support to providers who are doing the very important and difficult work of caring for children, period, um, but children with higher need um, in addition. So um, what is a special accommodation grant? Um, probably most of you know what that is on some level. Um, it's ebbed and flowed in terms of how it's um, uh, structured over the years and, and how it's uh, doled out to um, folks applying for it. So it's a grant that's offered to early care and learning programs, as you can see on the slide. Um, it pays for um, children with special health needs or any high behavioral support needs um, in order to stay safe in the childcare setting and you know, ultimately um, have continuity of care and have a positive experience in the childcare environment. Um, the funds are currently intended to provide continuity of care for, um, for children and to pay for a one-on-one -on -one aid for a, a limited amount of time for uh, up to a six month period for each each grant. Um, historically, the grant also um, allowed for um, an applicant to ask for uh, equipment funding or educational support or things beyond just a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, this time around, that's not the case. Um, the current funding available in the, in the state budget is uh, um, 350,000 and it's deployed in three rounds this time around, this fiscal year. Um, the payment is done differently this year too. It's done um, via reimbursement. So historically, a child care program um, could apply for the grant and get, and if they were awarded the funding, got the funding up front. Um, this time around, because of some federal guidance, um, it's turned to an RFA or a request for application process and a, a provider needs to um, receive the grant and then um, periodically submit um, to get payment reimbursement. 
Um, so that's one of the challenges um, of it. Um, it is an important support to childcare providers. Um, we are hoping to advocate for um, 500,000 for the next fiscal year. Um, and then there's other sort of pieces to this that are, are non-budgetary that we would like to advocate for as well. Um, and Margaret, I don't know if we wanna dive into that or. I, or yeah. Trying to move to the next slide. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> move to the next slide. Oh my goodness. Well, if anyone can commiserate with um, going with the flow, it's child care people in the child yeah, care. Yeah, really. Can people see that? and beyond. Can people see that, <laughs> that slide there. Um, so yes. so um, just a little history of this. The special accommodation grants were not um, on the Alliance agenda um, for, you know, you know, until last year. And it was because of something that um, often happens uh, in the advocacy sphere, you know, um, we found that uh, the, that money uh, for, the, for the grant program was going to be swept out of the budget in the budget reconciliation process. And it was um, uh, going to be used to, uh, to pay for other um, aspects of CIS. Which was um, which had also gone through um, a shift of funding, and as we know, CIS, the Children's Integrated Services, is a really important suite of programs um, for um, families and children throughout Vermont. And so, um, when the special accommodation grants were going to be um, reduced, um, two issues arise. One, the general issue that everybody has been familiar with is that the $300,000 in funding were usually expended by about February of any school year. So there wasn't just, you know, the money going away, there was just not enough money in the program generally. And, um, and then there were um, other aspects of um, just thinking about the grants um, and, and, how, and how they're used and, um, and deployed in the state. So last year, um, a group of folks, especially from Chittenden County, really rapidly organized to testify in front of the House um, Health uh, House Human Services Committee for, on the importance of the special accommodation grants. And so um, that um, really pressured uh, CDD to reconsider and to put those grants back into their budget. But one of the other things that happened, there was a lot of discussions about accountability and the structure of the grant. So the changes that you see this year in the application process and in how the money is being spent um, did come out of that, you know, okay, we're going to put the grants back, but now we're going to put a different kind of uh, fence around, you know, accessing those funds. Um, so this year, you know, you know, the uh, advocacy community, you know, agrees, and I hope you do too, that the structure of the program and the funding is still not adequate to the needs. So we went, uh, you know, and, and advocated for an increase of the funding to $500,000, which isn't a huge amount, but is, you know, is more and would probably at least get most programs through a nine-month school year. And um, a couple of other things that were not budgetary. One, to have the program occupy its own line item in the governor's budget. Um, currently, it is glommed in with, uh, like in one of these line items where you can't actually see what money is SAG grant, what money is, you know, some other little program and see it, it's like squished together. And because we care about this program so much, we want to be able to see and track it because we don't want the excuse of, the program being underutilized as um, an excuse for the money to just go away. And because in an environment where folks are um, always looking to save money, when money is not used all the way, that's the first money they think about moving somewhere else or eliminating. And as, um, as Sharon uh, spoke about, because of the structure of the grant program now being much more uh, difficult and also the payments being moved to a reimbursement model, um, there is more danger that the money will be underutilized because it's hard to get to now. If um, I don't know if there's anyone on the uh, on the on this issue session that 
you know, has done that application, but it's, um, it's considerably more difficult than it's been in the past. It, it requires um, much more supporting uh, documentation from outside sources. And um, given the reality of the working life of most uh, early care and learning uh, programs, especially small ones, it's a heavy lift. And that is also combined with the fact that specialized childcare uh, coordinators in the regions, uh, you know, it's, they have a limited scope of being able to help with this grant as they have in the past. So there's definitely some changes. Um, and our main asks were these uh, one budgetary ask, and then this one, these two non budgetary. So what happened was that the House Human Service Committee, um, great group of people really did listen to us and they, um, you know, they understand, they certainly remember the testimony from last year and they, they understand the importance of the SAG grants. And so they did request in their letter to the House Appropriations that the SAG grants do maintain their own line item in the budget so that the money can be seen and we can pay attention to where it's going. Um, and that was, you know, in some ways, uh, against their nature because committees don't like to micromanage line items. You know, it's sort of, it's, it's way deep in the weeds, but uh, they did in their letter mention the importance of the funding and how um, there's a constituency of people who are paying attention to it. The idea of getting more money was not uh, as strongly advocated for, but um, we're on their radar. So when you speak with your uh, delegation today. If there's anyone in your delegation who is on House Human Services, please thank them for paying attention to the to the SAG grants and mentioning that, and also just continue to advocate for the um, uh, for the uh, for the program. Um, Margaret, and, I'd like to jump in just in a, and so I just want to sort of in a more, you know, sort of in, with the human lens of, of advocacy. Um, I'm, you know, I've been doing my role here for um, 15 years and was a child care provider in direct care prior to that. And um, advocacy is relatively new to me. And frankly, it was partly because I was a little pessimistic about my one voice um, having that much power. Um, but as Margaret spoke to, um, Last year, some folks from Chittenden went to the State House and, and spoke with the House, House and Human Services and walked the hallways. And it was three of us. It was a child care um, center director. It was myself and a parent who um, had a child with special health needs who utilized the special accommodations grant and was aghast that it was um, that it had disappeared. And we were there to ask for it to be um, replaced. And honestly, I am so thankful to the House and Human Services Committee. First of all, I love Vermont. It was so organic. I, uh, the three of us um, got to really speak from our own lens and it was a really nice collaboration. I spoke from the CIS lens and the support community for childcare providers and the children and families within them. And, um, but really an exceptionally powerful voice was um, the childcare provider director herself. And then, and then the parent of this child, she spoke eloquently and passionately. And, you know, the, the, the House and Human Services Committee um, was very visibly moved by her voice. And um, inevitably, they reinstated the funding. And, and I'm, I, to this date, uh, I'm a full believer that one voice does make a difference. Um, and especially a collaboration of voices from various factions, um, such as, you know, the CIS um, specialists and those who partner with that group, from parents um, advocating for their children's needs directly, and from child care providers, both center-based and home-based and school age, all three. Um, one of the things I will say is that there is some uniqueness to the challenges of special accommodations grant on top of all the challenges. Um, it, is, it is an important piece of funding. It is helpful. We want it. We want to advocate for more funding. We would also like the system of, of getting the money out to providers to function better for them and acknowledge even pre-pandemic um, the challenge and the time limits that they have on, on focusing on a 
40 page RFA and seven di different pieces of documentation to apply for a grant. Um, it's just one little fraction of all the things they're, they're working hard to do. Um, and we really want them on the floor with children and talking to families and collaborating with families. And we would like them to not have to spend their valuable time um, you know, doing all of this paperwork and, and worrying about whether something needs to be encrypted and, and all that stuff. So um, I just wanted to say that, that your voice is important. Your solo voice is important. The collaborative voices are important. And um, the state house does listen and they are pretty, pretty versed <laughs> after the last few years on even the special accommodations grant, even though it's this small little line item. Well, we hope it's a line item, um, but it's this small little um, pot of money comparatively. So I want to interject here. There's a question in the chat from Ann Dillenbeck about, do we have suggestions about accountability that um, would be different? And I think, um, I think my, like my personal suggestion as somebody who I, I write a lot of grant proposals for, you know, is that it, it should be, I think there's two things. I think that their CDD in the past has um, administered other programs. I think um, strengthening families is one, um, you know, other programs that where there was, I think, excellent accountability of how the money was being spent by having contact with community partners. Um, and that it, it should be somewhere between, you know, a 42 page RFP and a, and a state contract and a letter to CDD. You know, I think that it was a fairly, um, uh, special accommodation grants were maybe fairly easy to get at one time. And I think that's like somewhere in between. And um, there's, I think that what we're asking is for, is for CDD to be just a little bit more creative in understanding uh, the realities of these situations. This is money that is supposed to be available quickly to provide community of care, often in very escalated situations. So. You know, we want people to be able to access the funds quickly, um, but then um, I don't think anybody objects to being accountable to how the funds are spent and that the current system is a little bit slow. It's very laborious. And um, I think we all believe in accountability. And I think documenting your needs is not too much to ask, but there it's it's kind of gone. The pendulum has swung one way, you know, a little bit farther. and. Again, you know, the legislature, I mean, state government runs the way it does, but I think just, you know, a putting some, using our voices to raise some awareness about how difficult this is can often make changes happen within the administration. I also, also think there's, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to warn you, I just got a sign that we're going to have a fire drill here at Prouty, so, <laughs> so something may happen here, so. <laughs> Thank you, just trying to make this exciting. Yeah. Um, one of the things I will say in terms of accountability already in place is that um, some of the requirements for the child care professionals and programs that um, can apply for this grant um, are that they have to have um, three stars or more, and they also have to take um, specific trainings um, that required of the, the director themselves, but also of the staff themselves. Um, and they uh, need to have um, something called specialized child care status active. Um, and so those are, those are some measures that um, make them eligible to apply for this grant, um, shows a level of investment on their part for supporting this population of children and families. Um, and also there's always been, I believe, there's always been a um, follow-up report um, at the end of the grant cycle where they specifically have to list you know, what they use the funding for, how did it go, what is their plan to move forward because this is a finite amount of funding for them. The expectation from CDD is that they're gonna take this, this time that this money is with them and, and figure out um, how to get other more um, long-term supports in place. I would love to move to the world of having a conversation about what those long-term supports are and how um, Children's Integrated Services is a part of that, and also about even beyond that. You know, there was a time, and and Dylan Beckham, looking at you, way back when there was um, small equipment grants available to childcare programs and things like that. 
that are very um, concrete and supportive um, and, and, and a one-time funding, you know, sort of burst to a program that needs it. Um, I would also like to make this, this funding much more accessible to home providers. Home providers, just by nature of the structure of a home providing program, um, often is a really great um, match for a child who has higher needs that get overstimulated in larger environments and things like that. And so I would like some acknowledgement <laughs> of that. And um, I get on my soapbox whenever I can um, for all providers, but specifically home providers who are, are leaving the field, unfortunately, um, they are um, invaluable to this population as well as centers and school age um, folks. Just another question in here, somebody asked, what's the average size of a special accommodation grant? I mean, I know last year um, about 95 children were served from the grant with $300,000. So that like debts out to about $3,100 per kid. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm actually, I don't have a real number on there, but it's not an enormous amount of money. And if you're using that to hire a one-on-one -on -one aid, you know, often they are not full time, you know, they're coming in during certain times of the day, you know. Um, so I think it's a help, but it's not necessarily going to cover a program's total expenses if they need. And a um, shift for more, CDD. More and a shift for CDD in their structure of this is now that when you apply, if you have more than one child that you're hoping to get funding for, First of all, it's, it's up to $10,000 in a six month period per child that you can apply for. Um, but they, they would like one grant package coming from a program. So um, if you have more than one child, they're hoping, as you can imagine in terms of just the monetary piece of this, they're hoping that you might be able to get fund an IA that's going to support more than one child, hopefully. The reality of that is that children are in different classrooms and, um, children have different needs, a level of needs. And um, so that's not always, it, it's, it's obviously childcare providers are versed in, in stretching all the support they get um, to the best they can, um, but it's not always possible to um, get funding for one person and then spread that person over several children. It's logistically um, not always the way it works. So I was wondering if uh, anyone here had um, had a plan for or a story to tell about these grants and a plan for how they're going to um, approach their legislators and what and if they'd like to practice or at, or at least just share with us um, their thoughts on this topic. And we'll also happy to take any questions that come in as we're here. I suppose I could speak a bit. Um, I'm from the Lamoille Family Center. I'm the one of the uh, specialized child care coordinator and I share that position with two other people. Hi Sharon. And um, this was all very new to me. My role changed like that. This became my, that I was the interface between the person applying and then the state and it, and it was a, with the time frame that they introduced it was very tight and and felt like what you said earlier margaret that they, they actually deliberately set up fencing <laughs> so we all were kind of scrambling and felt like we had to jump through tons of hoops that made it very difficult i'm working with three providers who are seeking these funds to have one-on-ones and you know it's it's so important that they have the money. Um, otherwise, these children would not be able to stay, you know, in sight. Um, yeah. That said, I mean it's 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 kind of heartbreaking to try to. Oops, sorry, my phone's ringing. It's heartbreaking to try to um, figure out that if they don't get it, you know, why don't they get it? And and I've had them had to apply more than one time. It's just a very tight time frame. Yeah, and I think that that is one of the things that to me as just like a citizen of Vermont, I will say it's kind of offensive that children who need special care have to go into a competitive grant process to get something they actually need 
to grow and learn. It's, you know, children with special needs, you know, are entitled to services. Um, and even though these things aren't necessarily, you know, in the early, you know, the same kind of things that are uh, required in early intervention, I mean, to me, I would like to see us spending a little bit more money and, and giving access to kids who otherwise would, you know, be in danger of having to leave the program, which also then, you know, creates an enormous hardship for their families, many of whom are, you know, folks who are working and need for their children to be in care. So um, it's such a tiny amount of money, but it has an enormous impact on the quality of life for kids and families. And, you know, it, there's, there's something about having it be a grant process. And I think what this points to is something that, um, you know, we have been advocating a lot is just how, how underfunded um, Children's Integrated Services is, um, because all of those efforts are, are super impactful for individual kids and families, and they're, it, it, this is a symptom of a, um, a larger um, issue around underfunding for yeah. support services. And one of the things, to, one of the facts is that, um, first of all, a child uh, for a child to get this funding in a child care program, um, they need to be either working toward or be on a plan um, with goals, you know, that are structured and, and all of the things. So yes, these absolutely, Margaret, are our children who should just be getting this level of support and the folks caring for the child should be getting an immense level of support to do this work. And I feel like um, often we're speaking out of both sides of our mouths when we um, speak to the importance of continuity of care and especially for children um, who have um, suffered historical, you know, historically suffered from trauma and, and all the things that are talked about that they need, which we all are very versed in, is, you know, continuity of care and, and consistency and a rhythm and a routine and not being bounced from program to program or not even in childcare because their needs are so great. Um, what we need is to, to stabilize them and help that um, child care placement be um, successful. And that is where the bulk of our, our, special, our children's integrated services providers can come in and collaborate with the child care program. It puts them on site, not only to care for the child, but also to model support um, and strategies and things like that for the child care providers themselves. This is shoring them up to, and also it gives um, the family who is working um, a place where the child's needs can, can be met with their peers. Um, so it's, it's, yes, it's a small amount of funding and, and yes, it's incredibly important. Patty, I. Yes, yeah, so I would definitely agree. It's um, a small amount of funding and incredibly important. One, uh, so you have a couple of thoughts, but the, the first is um, that focus over the, the last years, which is so important around not expelling kids from programs, you know, and I think that people are so committed to this kid is ours, we need to do it, we need to make it work. And applying for a special accommodations grant, if you're not able to get it, um, and even sometimes if you do get it, that idea that um, the child won't need to leave the program, right? Because we've said that's really awful and nobody wants to do that, right? So the child's not gonna leave the program, but I get concerned sometimes when it's really not a good situation for the kid, <laughs> you know? Like um, they're not at risk of losing their placement, but, but um, there can be some factors when kids' needs are not being met in a program, then uh, it, it, can, it can get pretty ugly, right? <laughs> to be perfectly honest, you know, and we don't want that for kids either, to be kept in a spot because folks are committed that, that is not meeting their needs, really, you know, and I have, we, uh, my program has gotten into a spot a couple of years ago as well, where the person we hired you know, it wasn't a great fit. I, I, I was just feeling so uncomfortable because I felt like it, it was, you know, we're glad it's spring and let's just make it through the end of the school year. But um, just that, that feeling of, um, I don't know, 
that they are very complicated situations, right? I mean, the reason you're applying is because this is maybe one of the hardest things you've had to face <laughs> as a program and, um, and doing it well for kids is important too. It's not just about the, the money for the providers, but, but for the kids, if they don't get it, it, it is, um, it's maybe not a good not a good scene. And, and that leads to my second point, um, which is just about the responsibility of the school districts for kids who are on IEPs as well. I just, I feel like um, CDD, it's great that there's this support for providers coming from this direction. Um, but, but what is the um, Accountability, what is the hope that we would have for school districts to provide the support and um, help, even if you have the one on one around how to help that child be successful in the program? So, thank you. I think both of those points are great and really point to how I think we're all focused on trying to get the best outcomes for kids within what we can do. And I mean, it's true. Sometimes situations, I think people, you know, you know, do the best they can and situations change. And I, and, you know, the question about how uh, school districts uh, interact with uh, preschool providers is, it's a, it's a huge question. And, um, I, but I think it, again, it points back to a chronically under-resourced system. And it and some of those resources include things like the support and individualized training that staffs might need to deal with a unique situation. Um, but I also think that Vermont is small enough and we have enough expert native expertise where more of that could possibly be available to people if it was resourced well. And uh, so, yeah, great points. And one of the things that I, I think this, so this, I feel like the special accommodation grant on some level is a small, it's a, that small funding and, and it's a Band-Aid for now. We appreciate it. It's, it's useful in its, in its, in its way. Um, and this begs a bigger discussion about how we're supporting children more broadly um, in group care. Um, and Patty, I absolutely hear you that sometimes a child's needs are at any given moment so great that being in a group setting isn't working for them. Um, and this is an opportunity and a little bit of funding to investigate what, what does work and um, what, what measures might be able to be put in place. And that's why I would hope that we could get, get a broader discussion about, uh, about support in general, but in terms of the accommodation grant that we, we put back the little bit of flexibility that was in there um, in terms of it not just being for IAs, but also being for um, really supporting the full environment of the child care program. Um, because, you know, we're looking at each situation with each child very uniquely, hopefully, and this gives us a little bit of breathing. This funding gives you a little bit of breathing room to have that, have that um, discussion and investigation about is this the best place for this ch this child? And so it, it allows you to um, have the perspective of the child's needs and the other children in the room around them, their needs as well. Um, it gives you a little bit of breathing room for that, ideally. Um, and 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 then I, what I would like to see is a system that has other supports that you could also consider. And um, we've certainly I'm excited to continue having those conversations. If I could just say one more thing too, at risk of sounding too negative, we have used special accommodations grants before when that's absolutely all that was needed and we it, it was perfectly successful, you know? I mean, so sometimes that absolutely does fit, fit the need. I guess I was gonna, thinking about the, the relationship with the school and, and that is that it, you know, a lot of, either if it's a health issue that a child needs care without a child care or be health and, you know, trauma based behavioral stuff. I mean, it's so much better to, to, to support a family earlier on because otherwise it becomes an exponent, could become an exponential problem, you know when they get into the school system. So it, it does make sense to start even earlier 
with supports. I also think, and this is this is maybe I'm going to say this quickly because it's probably more of a, a, a different group <laughs> discussion, but it ties to this, um, and that's that um, sort of in our our, our chronically unresourced um, world of of childcare that um, and and this is something I'm always trying to bring to the forefront is the, the perspective of the childcare provider and professional themselves. And one of the things that I've seen have success in our county is the therapeutic childcare programs and their relationships with our mental health clinicians and for them, right? So they get some time to, with those mental health clinicians to really problem solve and strategize and look at each child individually and create an actual plan and be more proactive about that level of support. And I would like to, that to be part of the system of support to child care providers. Um, and, and, and this grant would support that, but um, that's, a, that's a layer that I would like to, to look at. Wondering if anybody else has anything to chime in on. There's no shame in ending early and going and getting a cup of coffee, just saying. Um, even in the live sessions that used to happen. So, you know, don't don't feel like we, we have to fill the entire space. There's my fire. There it goes. <laughs> I, I would also say that um, if anybody has any sort of um, organic questions about the special accommodation grant structure right now. It has shifted and it has changed and it's a little complicated. Um, I am happy via email to, um, I'll put my email in the chat if anybody um, wants to check in with me. I am trying to collect stories too. I would I would um, advocate for all, all of the um, CIS childcare per, uh, coordinators across the state to do the same in their regions. Um, to collect those stories uh, so that we can um, show evidence of uh, um, the importance of special accommodations grant, but also the challenges with it. And um, in terms of utilizing the funding to show evidence that we need the funding worries me um, when there's barriers for applying for the funding and receiving the funding. Um, because I don't think just not drawing down the funding is indicative that whether we need it or don't need it, it's not that simple. Um, so if you have stories, if you're parents, guardians, if you are a childcare provider, um, please let your childcare coordinator know those stories so that we can continue our level of advocacy um, on behalf of children in your programs and um, those who we hope to get into your programs. Um, so thank you all. <laughs>